Hello, welcome to Notre Dame's Industry Insights. I'm Jack Swarbrick, the James E. Rohr Director of Athletics at the University of Notre Dame. And it's a privilege for me to be able to host this segment today. The bar has been set very high by the, the previous editions of this show, where members of the leadership team at Notre Dame have spent time in discussions about an industry and the challenges it faces with some of the leaders in that industry. We join that today uh, with a very special guest and I think a topic of great interest. But let me take a moment to set it up because it's a, uh, it's a virtual extension of something we'd hope to do in person. Um, Sarah Leapshire and a number of people here developed the idea of hosting an annual summit in which we'd bring leaders from the sports industry to come in and talk about specific topics. We were planning to do it in New York. We had it all set up for May. Um, the places were booked, the arrangements were made. Today's guest had done an amazing job of attracting the, the leaders throughout the sports world. And of course, COVID hit. And so we weren't able to do it, but we said, no problem, we'll do it next May. Well, as we sit here um, in December, uh, next May doesn't look a lot more feasible than last May. And so we decided we better jump on this topic now and use this format, this forum, as a way to do it. So I am thrilled to be joined today by Pete Pavacqua, the chairman of the NBC Sports Group. Pete is a 1993 graduate of the University of Notre Dame. It pains me every time I have to say that because it reinforces how much younger he is than me. <laughs> With a, where he earned his degree in English went on to earn his uh, JD from Georgetown University Law Center, and then went to work with the uh, New York firm of Davis, Polk, and Wardwell. Um, like me, Pete decided maybe that uh, that profession wasn't the ultimate destination for him. So he had subsequent uh, stints with the USGA as the chief business officer, the head of global golf for creative artist agency, and uh, then he became the CEO of PG, the PGA of America. And he served in that capacity from 2012 to 2018, at which time he joined NBC Universal as the, as the president of NBC Sports. And as I said, is now its chair. He is an enormous um, friend of Notre Dame, a really important voice in the sports industry generally, but also a great friend. We're thrilled to have him today. Pete, welcome. Uh, Jack, great to be here. It's nice to, uh, nice to see you. I, I much prefer to be on campus and seeing you in person or doing this in New York as we had planned, as you said, last May. But uh, we're playing that the hand we're, we've all been dealt. So it's great to be with you. Well, thanks for joining us. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about a topic that you and I love to talk about when we get together. Probably the most vibrant industry in, in the world today, uh, arguably. You and I recently did a segment um, on, on a sh show we call Bench Warmers, um, where we, we've had the opportunity to talk to leaders about culture and its development and, and what, makes, what makes great cultures in business and sports. In the course of that session, which I hope our audience has had the chance to see, you said something that struck me as so true to the mark. You said that in your current position, as chair of the NBC Sports Group, you worry every day that you're gonna wake up the next morning and find out you own the corner record store, that the industry is changing at such a great pace that you have to particularly try and get ahead of that and figure out where it's going. That was the perfect anal analogy to what's going on generally in our world. You know, the, the revolution Steve Jobs created with music where he, he changed us, he caused us to fundamentally see the consumption of music in a different way. And I was thinking as the Christmas purchases are starting to arrive at the Swarbrick household, how interesting it is that I don't care how it's delivered to me. I don't know whether it's Amazon or UPS or FedEx, but that's irrelevant to the content I'm receiving. So where's the marketplace for accessing video content today? Where's it's heading? Where, where it's heading? What, what are the trends you're dealing with? Well, it's so interesting, Jack. And, and you know, you and I were laughing about it a little bit before we, we went on here. Uh, 
you learn a lot from your children. And my, my, my kids, our kids are 13, 10, and 7. We have a daughter and two boys. And I think back to my time as the CEO of the PGA of America when I got the call from NBC to come join them and to run the sports group. And I love the PGA of America, but it was getting, you know, to be fair, a little repetitive by the, that sixth year. And I remember going home and having the conversation with my wife, Tiffany, saying, hey, I can go to work for NBC, NBC Sports, this great iconic brand. But in this industry that is changing so rapidly that I am going to be challenged, I'm going to be on my toes, we're going to have to adapt and be progressive, or we're going to get left in the dust, you know, the corner record store reference. And then we gathered the three kids and said, hey, dad might be going to work for NBC. And their, initial, their immediate reaction is, what's NBC? And it scared me, as it should, because they have no concept of what it means to turn on NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox at a, at a predetermined time at, at a, on a certain night or day to watch a show. They consume content continuously but most of it starts on some form of streaming device or service, much like a YouTube or a Netflix or now with us, Peacock. So it is this whole shift. NBC, historically, for the last 15, 20 years, has been a broadcast first, cable second enterprise. And out of necessity and to make sure we were not getting left behind, we had to call that audible to what is a streaming service that NBC could launch to compete with the YouTubes and the Hulus and the Netflix and now the Disney Plus, ESPN Plus, HBO Max. And that was the advent of Peacock. So what you realize is much like you getting your Christmas gifts and not really overly concerned about where they're coming from, we just have to make sure that we do the best job reaching the broadest demographic as possible. Now, there's still that traditional historic bond between our viewers and a certain property. And I think a perfect example of that is Notre Dame football. Notre Dame fans, college football fans around the country, they know that the home of Notre Dame football is on NBC and where to find it on a Saturday. And that relationship started when I was a student at Notre Dame. It's been a great long relationship. We have a similar type of dynamic with the Olympics a similar type of dynamic with our Sunday night football property. But the vast majority doesn't really have that bond. So you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to cut through all the noise that's out there right now and tell people, okay, this is our offerings, whether it's NBC, NBC Sports Network, USA, E, now Peacock, Telemundo, our Spanish speaking station. And there's so much noise and so much content out there right now that you have to be more disciplined and more strategic than ever. But I think selfishly for you, for me, for the university, for NBC Sports, what really still cuts through all of that is the power of sports. People are still wanting to search out and watch sports when it's happening. Whether you watch the Clemson game on NBC or the North Carolina game uh, on Friday on, on ABC, you're not gonna you're not gonna tape that game and watch it later. You're gonna watch it as it's happening. So really, the two elements, the two systems that have emerged from this are sports and news. So what's so important for NBC and our NBC strategy from a broad television, cable, streaming perspective? is how do you utilize the power of these great sports properties to make sure people understand, okay, I know where I'm watching Notre Dame football. I know where I'm watching Sunday night football in the Olympics. And then when you've amassed those eyeballs, telling them about the other uh, the content that we have across the board. But I think sports, and granted I'm biased, is the tip of the spear and more of a kind of a dominant position as the tip of the spear across the media landscape now than, than probably ever in our lifetimes. Does, does, is, is that power, the power of sports, does it provide a floor for cord cutting? Um, is, is, is it what will make sure an important segment of obviously the Comcast business in some, one form or another has to stay present to handle that? Yeah, we talk about internally, we talk about the bundle. So what keeps the NBC bundle together? So when, we're, when our content uh, distributors, the people in our, in our 
enterprise that really handled those negotiations with the large companies like Comcast, which is obviously our, our owner company, or you think about a, a charter or a dish or an AT&T or others, we talk about, okay, what keeps that bundle together? What is the most attractive element of that bundle? What can people not do without? And it continues to prove that it is sports. You know, you don't want to watch, you don't want to miss that Sunday night football game. You don't want to miss that NFL playoff game. You don't want to miss the Olympics. You're not going to stand for missing that, that Clemson at Notre Dame game. And you could go sport by sport, the power of the World Series, the power of the NBA championships, all of those great premier sports that are out there. It very much is the glue that holds the bundle together because the passion level of people watching sports when it happens, there's really no substitute for that. Now, my wife and I watch a ton of shows on, on NBC and elsewhere. We just got done watching Queen, The Queen's Gambit, which you know, was fantastic. And we, it was a seven episode series. We watched three episodes the first night, and then we watched four episodes the second night and finished that in, in a two day period. And we wanted that and we watched it and we enjoyed it. And for us, it justifies a Netflix subscription fee. But again, you know, you're always going to go back to, okay, what am I really passionate about as a sports fan? What will I do to watch it? I have to watch it live and I have to make sure I can get it. I think about, you know, I got out of Notre Dame, as you referenced, in 1993. The difference between 1993 and the, the hurdles we had to jump over and, and the efforts we had to make to watch an away Notre Dame game where you'd have to go to a sports bar or, or kind of try to figure out some way or some place you needed to be to try to get that away game. Now you don't miss a Notre Dame game because they're so easy to access. They're easy to access on the, whether it's an ABC or, or a, an ESPN that might do an away game or a streaming service or a different type of platform. You can go out there and hunt for those games, find that content. And again, I get back to what I said, Jack, I think now more than ever sports is really the fundamental glue that are holding those large cable bundles together. You know, Pete, I, I, I can't help but note someone, someone listening to this is today is saying to themselves, well, it'd be easier to see all the games if Comcast would pick up the ACC network, but we'll stay away from that. Topic. <laughs> um, I hear you. I hear you. Um, Peacock has been a huge success. I, I, I think has exceeded every, every expectation of sort of the media analyst um, performed so well. What role will sports play in Peacock's future? It's really an interesting question, and it has outperformed even our aggressive estimates. And the I think back to when the development of Peacock started, and granted, and thankfully, sports had a role in that. And it was about being the combination of timely and timeless, and understanding that there seemed to be an empty space in the overall streaming paradigm where people wanted to go to get content, didn't necessarily want it to pay an additional fee and would be uh, amenable to a limited amount of advertising. So that was basically the beginning of the DNA of the structure of Peacock. Let's create a streaming service. Let's make it timely and timeless. And let's have it be an AVOD, which is an acronym for an advertising-based video on demand as opposed to an SVOD, which is a subscription-based video on demand, which would be, for instance, a Netflix where you have to pay for a subscription. For Peacock, you don't have to pay, you have to sign up. And we have well in excess now of, of into the 20 millions in terms of signups, which is really a, a, ter a terrific pace. And I would tell you, Jack, when it was first getting launched, there was a bit of a, a sentiment that maybe sports, although it fit the timely, it didn't necessarily fit the timelessness because in the streaming world, sports has a very short shelf life. So you could keep the Queen's Gambit on Netflix for years and people will be drawn to it and watch it at a pace they wanna watch it, whether it's watching all seven episodes in one night or maybe not finding out about it for a few years and coming back to it. But that is the stronger shelf life than that North Carolina Notre Dame game uh, okay. last Friday. But what, what, 
we kept saying as the people in the sports group kept raising our hand and saying, yeah, but just like with the broadcast the linear universe, people hunt out and search for sports because their passion draws them to sports. And so what we were going to do is we were really going to use the Tokyo Olympics as a catalyst to show the power of sports on Peacock. But of course, with the postponement of Tokyo from last July to this upcoming July and July 21, we had to shelve that idea. We quickly called an audible and said, which great property of ours can we work with that has enough content, enough games? You know, Notre Dame's different. There's a finite number of home games. You really can't take too big a chance on a particular home game. But we circled our Premier League, our English soccer, and said, okay, we have roughly you know, in excess of 300 Premier League games. We have historically put those on NBC and NBCSN. Let's take a large chunk of those, roughly 175 of those games, and put them on Peacock. Let's circle the day that Peacock is going to have its national launch, which was July 15th of this summer. Let's get six really good Premier League games and tell people the only place you can watch these are on Peacock. And it had it, it, it moved the needle enormously in terms of the number of signups we got that day from Premier League fans because they were they were going they were not going to miss those games. Now, with that, we also got a lot of negative comments and negative press. We've we had uh, angry users. We had death threats. You know, how dare you move this game off of NBC Sports Network and put it on Peacock? Because some people are just resistant to change. But we kept our heads down. We explained how easy it was to find. And that has continued to move the needle. Then fast forward to September, we secured over the course of the summer, we secured the USGA championship rights back from Fox to put them back onto NBC. Obviously, the biggest of those properties, the U.S. Open. This year, the U.S. Open, instead of being played in its traditional uh, time period, which ends on Father's Day in June, it was played in September. But we said, OK, let's take two hours of really prime, valuable coverage of the U.S. Open. Let's take from five to seven o'clock on Thursday. Everybody, I don't want to say home from work because we all work from home now, but really after work hours when people are going to relax and watch the U.S. Open, they're going to have watched it on Golf Channel up until five o'clock because we have the Thursday and Friday coverage on Golf Channel. But at five o'clock on Thursday, let's abruptly say now to go watch those remaining two hours with some of the best marquee groups out there, you have to go to Peacock. And again, it was an enormous mover of the needle for Peacock, proving the power of sports. So we're testing that out to show people and to prove that sports moves the needle, not only in the linear sense, on broadcast and cable television, but also with streaming. Premier League has done that. The US Open has done that. We know the Olympics will do that uh, next year when we have them in July. And if I go back to the beginning of this pandemic, uh, the NFL reached out to its partners and said, we are going to add two additional wild card games. We successfully negotiated to get one of those two wild card games. And what we were adamant about in those negotiations with the NFL is not only did we want the rights for NBC, but we wanted to be able to simulcast that wild card game on Peacock. So everything we do now in the sports landscape, we absolutely have an eye on NBC. Of course, it's our most powerful platform. We have an eye on what we might do with those sports properties on cable. And then, of course, we have an eye on what we can do to continue to bolster Peacock. So it's become really kind of a, a three-pronged attack. Um, this is a little bit of a technical question, but are, are we to the point now where you can accurate, accurately measure viewership across all the platforms? You can. You know, we are still somewhat tied in the linear sense to what I think is a somewhat archaic system around Nielsen ratings which is a formula, as you know, but it's, it's somewhat reliable and it's out there. And now you can also measure, measure at home. So it's one thing to watch a, a Notre Dame game in your living room. It's another thing if you go to a restaurant or a sports bar and we're starting to get those measurements. So the answer is yes, you can measure an audience, but 
by far and away the most accurate measurement of an audience is on streaming. Right. Because you know that Jack Swarbrick is watching Yellowstone between a certain time at night. And uh, that is valuable because you know how your, your programs are performing. You know when people are watching. You know how many hours Jack Swarbrick is watching over the course of a month. And that becomes incredibly valuable data when you go to sell ads against those programs. It's all about the power of the demographic. We can go and tell uh, a car company or uh, a consumer goods product that this show is appealing to an 18 to 34 demographic for a certain amount of hours a month. And that becomes really powerful data to have at your fingertips. And it's far more accurate and far more measurable than on a linear surface. In, in, in my world, uh, it, it's hard to get athletic directors to agree on much. But, but one thing that I never get any argument about is that Notre Dame football has the highest production values in all of college football, all of college athletics generally. You, you provide us with an incredible team, starting with the best play-by-play -play guy in the world, Mike Tirico, this year, Tony Dungy. But, but what Rob Highland and Pierre and others do to, to, to bring forward the best possible production is amazing. One of the things you and I have talked a lot about, which I've loved your commitment to do, is to use Notre Dame as a bit of a laboratory. A, a bit of a place to experiment. So last year we did, we did the sky cam following live action um, and heard from all sorts of people who didn't think it was a great idea. Um, yep. Most of them said some version of, I felt like I was watching a video game to which I responded, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted people to feel like. But um, talk a little bit about that commitment to the production of Notre Dame football and its use for things like that. Yeah, well, you hit the nail on the head. It really is, it is that laboratory approach. And I, I go back to the meeting we had, Jack, with you and your team in our headquarters two and a half years ago, where you, you said that to us. You said, take some chances. Do some things with Notre Dame football that the NFL wouldn't be comfortable with. Use us as a testing ground and as a breeding ground for innovation. And I think there's such a comfort level based on the history of the relationship that, you know, I think, and this, I'm not, I'm not crediting myself for this. I'm crediting, you know, the, the people who came well before me of, of proving to Notre Dame that NBC sports was never going to do anything to embarrass the university. And you, you build that trust level over a series of years as you do with any relationship. So now we do push the envelope. And you think you mentioned Rob Hyland and Pierre Musa always kind of coming to us, to me, and then, you know, to you with ideas. Hey, can we try this end zone camera? Can we do that sky cam? What can we do in terms of analytics and different statistics? Hey, do you think there's any way Jack can talk to Coach Kelly and get us into the locker room to see his a bit of his halftime speech? And you know, as, as we like to think about it, it's great for us because we're able to test out technology and do things and then show those to other properties and say, hey, this is Notre Dame, one of the great sports brands, one of the great purest overall brands that there is. If they're comfortable with it, look how it worked. Let us try it in the NFL. Let us try it with the Olympics. But we also think we also believe it's a very powerful tool for the university you know, allow us to tell that Notre Dame story and to bring that story around the country. And that's, you know, the best partnerships are ones that are mutually beneficial. And, you know, this year, I would tell you, Jack, is a perfect example. You know, I, I just was on a, a Comcast board call, call earlier today. We had an NBC executive committee meeting a couple of weeks ago. And when you look at the performance of sports properties right now, because of the pandemic and how sports are being played at times that are not normally played. Think Major League Baseball, the NBA. Think about the postponement of the Olympics. You throw on top of this uh, a very divisive election that we're, we're finally getting through. But sports have taken it on the chin. And if you look at the performance of the NBA and the NBA Finals, significantly down. The NHL and the Stanley Cup, even Sunday night football being down 
from where we normally are. Uh, what has stood out is Notre Dame football. I mean, our ratings have been uh, historically strong this year. And obviously you could point to the Clemson game as the best college game of the year and one of those great uh, once a decade type games. So yes, that, but you know, you think about the other home games and it's been incredibly strong and yeah, sure. That part of that is this great uh, storybook season Notre Dame is having, but but again, it gets back to the power of the sports. It gets back to allowing us to push the use of technology to have a, an intimacy with the property that we're not afforded across the board. And, uh, and that really has served us incredibly well. And we've taken lessons we've learned in partnership with you and absolutely use those with other sports properties. Well, we could not have a better partner. And I, I remember when we got the ratings from the Duke game and I said, wow, okay, some, something's yeah. going on here. And, 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 and part of it has to be attributed to um, the decision by the university to go forward with the academic year, which was a decision then for us to go forward with the athletic year. And I'm so proud of this university for its decision to do that its commitment to see it through and, and the way in which it, it, it was so intelligent, but also flexible and creative about how to cause that to happen. There were going to be issues. There were going to be problems, but, but that commitment let us have a successful school year, but let us be in a position where today, no one's going to play more games this year. No one's going to have created a more compelling record and no one's been in front of America more than us. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a great place to be this year in a very difficult situation. Yeah, and it shows the power of leadership that obviously starts with, with Father Jenkins and you know, from a university perspective and obviously you from overseeing uh, athletics. But you know, it, those are tough decisions to make and they're not always popular. You think back to some of the, the articles in the major national newspapers back in August and when things were rough and people were saying, you know, why is Notre Dame doing this? And then fast forward and all of a sudden there's articles about, you know, why isn't the Big Ten playing football and why isn't this happening and what's going to happen to Ohio State? How can they possibly say they should be in the college football playoffs if they're only playing X amount of games? And, you know, Notre Dame, to its credit, kind of stood out there on a bit of an island and took some punches along the way, but just stayed determined. And looking at it by a sports uh, sports property perspective, those sports at the at the professional level that have strong leadership have fared well, and the sports that have kind of come in and come out have had a really tough go of it. And I think Notre Dame has led the charge at the university level. And and not to embarrass you. But, you know, I think one of the, the stories that needs to be told at the right time is I, I think nobody more than you is responsible for this football season happening at all. And uh, and it's 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 been a fun. Hey, there's been some bumps and bruises along the way, but it's been a phenomenal season and every sport is going through it. I mean, I, I think about my last five days, you know, we were geared up to have what would have been one of the biggest nights of the year for us with a primetime Thanksgiving NFL game between the Ravens and the Steelers, all of a sudden that gets bumped to Sunday afternoon and then it gets bumped to maybe Monday night or Tuesday night. And then, you know, all day yesterday on and off with the NFL about, okay, can we do it Wednesday? Well, yes, we can do it Wednesday, but we can't do it Wednesday on prime time because we have the tree lighting for Rockefeller Center, which is a 50 year plus program, but we can do it at 340 uh, and it's just, it's just, it's a crazy time for everybody, but that's why leadership that, that you've exhibited, that father Jenkins has exhibited, that some of the commissioners have exhibited in professional sports, I think has been tested more than ever. Well, and that you've provided the leadership you provided to NBC sports, Pete, I could do this all day long and you and I have from time to time, but, uh, we've, we, we, uh, we want to make sure our audience gets a, gets a shot as well. And so what we've done is, uh, invite, uh, few members of our audience to uh, throw some questions at us. And so we'll turn to that portion of the program now. Absolutely. Who's first up? I think that's me, Jack. It's Dan Cummings. Dan, great to have you with us. Fire away. 
I guess my question is, I'm afraid of losing what I already have. I have so much invested with Notre Dame and I love more of everything. And Jack told us five or six years ago that we'll be able to consume Notre Dame athletics in a number of different ways. And you're going to be able to do it in a number of different platforms. And Pete, here's a situation where promise is made, promise is kept. It's actually become simpler to consume Notre Dame properties today than it was. You talk about your kids and how they watch versus how they participate. Well, my question is a little bit different in that I'm curious how with the evolution, things that are sometimes good, sometimes not so good, we now have uh, fantasy leagues, sports uh, fantasy leagues growing pretty rapidly in size. We've got people become, I'm sorry, for real-time news, et cetera. Shelf life is order, shorter than it's ever been, Pete. I guess my question for you is how do you keep up with the news flow? How can you actually continue to cover this amount, this much broadband, or this much broadband with than it is today? Notre Dame, I think, is perfect. I've always thought that, and I always will. Yeah. Well, I would tell you, Dan, from a sports perspective, our answer to that is being more strategic than ever. And, and quite frankly, to use the term, just pickier than ever. You know, I think a lot of sports networks and sports entities kind of go out there with a machine gun approach about a sports entity becomes available. Let's do an analysis and let's put a bid in on it. Uh, you know, we, we are, I think, different. And I'm not saying we're better. We're just different. I think it's the NBC way. We're more of a sharpshooter approach where, okay, what makes sense for NBC? We ultimately think we can make big properties bigger and tell stories better than anybody else. We, we think that's kind of our secret formula. So you think about the sports entities that we have long-term relationships with, Notre Dame football, the Olympics, the summer and winter games, Sunday night football, NHL, NASCAR. We're very focused on creating these wonderful enduring partnerships with premier properties like the Triple Crown, like the Open Championship, the U.S. Open, the Ryder Cup, the Tour de France, and making them bigger. So we're, we're not running around in a million different directions chasing all of the noise. Uh, we're just being as disciplined as we can be. And I think we're going to be even more disciplined going forward. What are our North Stars? Let's make sure we don't lose sight of those. And I just named a bunch of them. What are some of the new properties that make it, uh, we should take a chance on? A great example is the Premier Lacrosse League. And it's an interesting sport. It's a growing sport. It was a regional sport that's becoming more and more national. It's the power of an individual, Paul Rabel, who started the league, who walks into a room and just lights the room up as somebody you believe in. And so we'll have one-offs like that. But for us, it's let's kind of put the noise out, realize what's important to NBC, make sure we do it, in our opinion, better than anybody and just stay after it. So I think the more noise that has been created across the industry is actually going to be advantageous for us because we're going to stay true to our mission and true to those properties that, that we've had great success with. We don't want 15 football, college football properties. You know, we want Notre Dame football. And if we were ever to do something else in the college football space, we would only do it if we came to Jack and Jack said, you know what, that makes sense for us in the University of Notre Dame. So we, I think we have, we, I know we have that discipline. And Dan, from our perspective, it, it, it's led to two things. One is we, we have to, in being a good partner with NBC and others, we've got to make sure we're telling our story effectively in, in, in other ways at different times. And so that's really what FIM has been about and what I'm, what I'm so proud of what they've accomplished. And the other is with that new cycle and all the information and sort of 24 hour talking about sports and talking about us, you better be pretty transparent about what you know and, and what you're dealing with. And, one of the things I'm really proud about in the pandemic here is that we made a commitment early on that we're going to share the testing information. And that was at a time where most people weren't prepared to do that. And we just said, this is what we're going to do every week. We're going to tell everybody how many tests we administered and how many positives and how many negatives and, and what the contact tracing results are. 
and and that's just one example of when you've got an issue, you better you better respond to it in a in a in an appropriate way for the values of this place with transparency, um, but also be producing the information yourself. Thank you. John and Kathy, you got a question for us? Hey, Jack. Hey, Pete. Uh, grateful to have the opportunity to uh, participate. Um, Pete, you've alluded to it a couple of different times, but you know the importance of understanding the remote fan, I would, I would define it that way, consumption behavior, how do you create awareness for the different uh, viewing opportunities? Um, as you said, the whole sort of the legacy sort of view of, sort of destination viewing place time event has been totally disrupted and probably accelerated through the pandemic because people have just been, they've been able to consume differently maybe and forced to consume differently. From, a, from an NBC Sports group perspective and maybe broader industry, I mean, what have the implications of that been as far as sort of analytics you have, uh, the kind of investments, investments you make in terms of you know, getting your arms around this kind of remote viewing behavior? Yeah, I mean, you, you do learn a lot of lessons and I think we have had a necessity over the course of this last seven or eight months. You know, how can you do more with less how can we do more from our headquarters as opposed to sending as many thousands of people to Tokyo next summer? Uh, and you really finally have the time to sit back and say, okay, what can we be doing differently to track a broader group of fans? To, you know, you're gonna watch a Notre Dame game, Jack, and we're, the people in this call are gonna watch a Notre Dame game, but how do I, how do I convince that that ten year old son of mine who loves football, loves Notre Dame, to sit down and watch the game? And I think you know what what we have said, and we spent a lot of time is figuring out where these trends are going and new technologies and new concepts, and, and two of them, which will have an impact on sports, and I think can bring a different, broader demographic into sports. One is esports. You know, that is something that's not going away. It's incredibly popular. Kids of all ages are playing it. Uh, and how do we tap into that universe and take an active role in esports and also utilize our ability to then talk to that audience to bring them over to more uh, traditional sports? That's something we're trying to figure out and quite frankly, haven't figured out yet. The other, which is you know, more difficult for a, for a, in a university context, but when you think about professional sports, and Jack and I have had this conversation now for a couple of years, is where, where's sports betting going? And what do we need to do? I've told our team and our leadership group that the worst mistake we could make is to put our head in the sand and wake up five years from now and realize that we, we missed this entire movement in sports betting. Sports betting is getting more and more legalized on a national level. We just did a couple of months ago, a, a large deal with PointsBet, which is one of the key sports betting companies. And for us, you know, we're not interested in the person who's gonna put a $20,000 bet on a game in an area where it's legal, but we're really interested in the gamification of games. So how do you talk about whether this next play is going to be a run or a pass or how many yards a quarterback is going to throw for or who's going to have the next touchdown? How do you talk about whether Justin Thomas is going to hit 12 greens out of the 18 or 13? And you think about those little bits of information and the interactivity that that allows for in sports. I think and we think that will capture the imagination of people who maybe won't sit down and watch a three hour football game or four hours of golf. If it can be more interactive, if we can, again, that gamification of the game. And when I see, again, to go back to my children, that's what they like, that's what keeps them engaged. You know, as I've said before, kids are following sports, but they're not watching sports, but they're following sports on Instagram and on Twitter and on different websites. And they're following the, 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 the love of the athlete is at an all time high, but we need to do a better job of now showing kids the full game. And how do you do that? How do you break it up into bits of data and analysis and analytics to make it 
more interesting for them in, in bursts of energy. And I think what we can learn through sports gaming and sports betting will help us what we can learn in terms of esports to make sure that we don't lose that next generation. And kind of what goes around comes around. And Jack opened up by, you know, saying that I, I like to talk about how my biggest fear is I'm going to wake up one morning and if we feel like we own the corner record store, we're in trouble. Then you read an article that in, in 2020, it'll be the first time in however many years that actually vinyl records have outsold CDs. So, you know, we might find that in 10 years from now, you, you want to own the corner record store. So you just, you never know. And we always have to look for those new trends, make sure we understand what people are doing, how they're consuming things, and that, we, that we're not operating in a bubble. We have to go outside of our bubble and not be afraid to mix it up and experiment and try different things. That's a great answer, Pete. And the one thing I would add to that is, is, is the, the coming of virtual reality and um, the demands that's going to put on us to figure out how to be able to bring you into the activity um, in a virtual way. Uh, if, if I can play a very elaborate video game and put myself in the game, um, it's not going to be too long before I want to be, I want to be the buck linebacker. Uh, on the next play, right? And so, how does how do we make that work? We uh, we're not going to let you transfer your physical traits in because we <laughs> we get killed on that play. But maybe we can put your your, your body in. Um, I know I know you've got to run uh, soon, Pete. We'll take one more question from Denny, and then we'll let you go, Denny. Hi, Jack and Pete. Uh, Pete, question: You know, Notre Dame, like most colleges this year have lost millions of dollars basically because no ticket sales, none of the other ancillary uh, things that go on on a typical weekend. Has NBC seen an increase in their revenues by having more people watch remotely? Um, and if so, do you see that trend continuing even once they do come back? And Jack, if I could ask you one more practical one, has, has the BCS come together with all the different uh, COVID protocols out there now, Big Ten's different than the ACC and different for the playoffs? Is there agreement on what protocols will be followed? And if so, or if not, is there a date certain by which the final game must be played? Well, well, Denny, I'll start. And one thing that we've learned through this whole pandemic is live sports are much better and more enjoyable when there's 80,000 people in the stadium or 50,000 people on a golf course. It just adds to the aura. Uh, I think, again, what Notre Dame has done far better than most is despite really trying circumstances, when you watch a Notre Dame home game, there's still a sense of a crowd from the student body and the staff and the band. There's still something there. You watch so many NFL games now or Major League Baseball games with absolutely nobody in the stadium. You know, I went out to our Sunday night football opener in the new SoFi Stadium in L.A. And there were about 200 of us there. And it was bizarre. So. You know, ratings, as, as I, I, again, as I mentioned, with the exception of a few, professional golf has done well. NASCAR has, has done well. Notre Dame football has done incredibly well. But sports ratings through the course of this pandemic have actually been, uh, have decreased. And I think that's because sports are bumping into one another more than ever, because everything kind of came back at the same time. Uh, as John made the point, people started doing some different things during this, this lockdown. You know, we've experienced, we own a business called Golf Now, which is an online tee time golf business. And it's been an enormous boom, boom for recreational golf. People are playing golf now more than ever because it's one of the things you can do outdoors that is safe. So we can't wait for sports to get back to the way they were with people in the stands. Uh, you know, I noticed that when we did our U.S. Open when you watch the, the, the masters, right? It's just a different vibe. And you also have to realize for us at NBC, yes, sports have come back, but you know, we own universal parks. And so we've taken a tremendous hit. 
We have a film business that's been effectively shut down and have taken a tremendous hit. So I think for just about every industry, this has been incredibly tough sledding. And, you know, maybe we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel here and we can all kind of get out of this. But uh, but it's a great question. But but still fans and stadiums, fans add to the to the overall element and aura of all sporting events. Um, I also think it's interesting. I think we've had different winners this year because you, 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 you haven't had the crowd dynamic. Some athletes respond to that in a very positive way and they draw energy from it. Others who in that environment might have crumbled don't have to face it now and so have had success. So I, I think it's had an interesting uh, impact on outcome. Relative to your, uh, the, the question directed to me, you've apparently been tapping my phone, so we're going to have to look into security. <laughs> um, but um, I am spending a ton of time right now in conversations with my CFP colleagues about the issues you've raised. Um, you know, without any central governance, um, I, I don't think I'm telling any secrets out of school here. I don't think there's any chance we'll have a common pro testing protocol. Um, for the CFP this year. I, I think we'll, we'll look to each conference to enforce its protocols rigorously and report on that. But I think that's about the best we're gonna do. The issue of what the time frame looks like is a fascinating one. And we are spending a ton of time on it because you've got two semifinals scheduled for January 1. What if one of the teams can't go? And how long do you wait? And the one thing we did decide and announce was we're not going to move the team up. We're not, going, we're not going to take somebody and move them up into, into a semifinal if another team can't make it. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to manage through that. A lot of work to be done. We, we haven't made a lot of the key decisions, which we'll be making in the next weeks. I want to thank our, uh, all our audience, but especially those who have joined us to ask questions. Pete, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Um, I am always Thrilled to have an opportunity to talk to you about what you're thinking about. You're, 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 you're one of the really important leaders in, in a business which is so critical to our success. And besides that, you're a pretty good Notre Dame fan. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the weeks and months ahead. But thanks for joining us today. No, Jack, it's always a pleasure. You know, uh, you know how much I love Notre Dame, anything I can ever do. Uh, and uh, Hey, congratulations on a, on a great season so far across the board and, uh, and look forward to seeing you soon and, and go Irish. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Pete. Um, we, we've talked a lot during this, uh, during this portion of the show about the, what the consequences of this shifting industry for us has been to be a content creator. We, we cannot allow ourselves to be in a position where we're, we're, we are depending upon others to communicate about us, that tells the story of Notre Dame effectively, um, but also ensures we're, we're, we're using some of the airspace. We're taking up some of the oxygen. I don't want to surrender it to other, other institutions with whom we compete. But we also have important reasons to want to tell our story, important messages we want to get out about the extraordinary people we get to work with every day and about how this university approaches athletics during a very trying time. And, and so we created Fighting Irish Media, FIM, to tell those stories and to represent us. And I could not be prouder of what they do and, and the demands they face grow every day, uh, especially as we've had to provide or wanted to provide content to the ACC network. To make that work, you have to have great storytellers. You have to have people who have a feel for that and our next guest is one of our very best storytellers. Um, she's a former member of our track and field team at Notre Dame, where she competed in the throws. Two-time captain, which tells you a lot about uh, the leadership she provided to those teams. She graduated in 2017 with a degree in film, television, and theater. And even when she was a student, began producing programming, which has turned out to be award-winning. Uh, one documentary she did, Remember When, focus on our women's basketball team, was an award-winning production. Um, and also a personal documentary she produced 
called Breaking the Cycle, which if you put Indy's name in and Breaking the Cycle, you'll be able to watch an incredibly powerful award-winning documentary. Um, so it's my great pleasure to, to introduce to you Indy Jackson of Fighting Irish Media to talk about a special project she's involved in. But the best way to sort of give you a feel for Indy and give you a feel for that project is to begin with the promotional piece she, she put together for this. So let's take a look at that. Stepping in a competition, it's like safety, freedom, and above all, silence. It's only when you step outside does the noise rush in. We're talking about race relations, and Notre Dame is getting national Great. attention. Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud that Arbery. noise are some people's reality, a reality bred by complacency. It's a harsh line of demarcation, right? Either you hate black people or you don't. That's not true. It's much more complicated than that. There are a large amount of people that are just not educated. They don't know what they don't know. Through sports, we learn that complacency is only broken through the pain of practice, that ability to be comfortable with discomfort. The time has come for us all to be athletes and practice humility through empathy, understanding, and above all love. It's not enough just to be on your own. We stand together. We all have the power to create a new reality. And to be honest, yeah. To be really honest with you, I don't see why we can't have fun along the way. Check this out. I ain't get my fork. I ain't know we was eating today at the table. Yes. Huh? Brave Voices at ND is a completely new podcast. It features black student athlete voices, and it's not an attack on people. It's an attack on complacent culture. We went to the monster truck rally. The only black person here. That was the first and last time I ever went to one, too. Brave Voices at ND creates conversation acceptance, healing, and it nurtures learning. The truth is, the battle we're all facing isn't easy, but the complications can actually be made easier through practicing communication and expanding upon experiences through listening. So yeah, drop your ego, leave the apprehension, and above all, let's commit to learning together. Oh and yeah, it may be awkward, but only for now. Indy, welcome. Oh, thanks, Jack, for having me. Uh, it's great to have you on. I, I hope that our audience has already um, tuned into the podcast of, of Brave Voices. Um, it, it is just great, as, as that promo, I think, gave some insight. It's a great and important discussion about the experience of Black student athletes at Notre Dame. Um, you're now well into it. You've, you've, we've had a number of the uh, podcasts been made available. What's the reaction been? What have you learned? So the reaction has been um, from our community overwhelmingly positive. I've had opportunities to continue conversation. Um, I've talked to people who are looking to continue to learn, um, asking for ways that they can, can contribute and be an ally. So it's been overwhelmingly positive. As far as what I've learned, um, besides how to be a great host like you, Jack, <laughs> um, uh, something that I've learned around the process is that I am so proud that we came up with the name Brave Voices because I didn't realize how much our student athletes um, are exuding bravery by making themselves so vulnerable um, about a topic that can be so controversial to most. So um, regarding how else we've been received sometimes outside of the community. It's not been the most powerful and positive things, but I know because we are getting feedback, we're doing the right thing, we're going in the right direction. And I'm so thankful for Notre Dame for giving us this platform to be able to voice how we feel and invoke change, evoke change. Well, you're making such an important contribution because I'm just constantly blown away by the personal experiences that individuals have that you know, frankly, I, I would have I would have hoped don't occur mm -hmm. anymore. But I'm I'm confronted with the fact over and over again that they do, yep. and and it's 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 not an unusual experience. It's part of sort of the day to day uh, existence of these students, and and that is that is so powerful for you to be able to to bring that forward. Um, and help, as you say, continue, continue that discussion, continue the dialogue. 
what what do you help what do you hope it helps create in our community and and i guess what can we do to help achieve that result so the first thing what a what a great question i love how you phrased it because the first thing that this podcast was going to do when I set out to do it was to create a space for black student athletes who experience these things that not everyone is aware of for them to come on a platform be heard and almost kind of a restorative justice by saying like this is what happened to us um and this is something the university is not shying away from so that is what the space was originally created for and it's evolved i'm learning to an educational component where people can listen to experiences that they didn't know that we go through constantly and daily so how you said um at the beginning that you're you are shocked to see these our our student athletes have these experiences that's what this platform is for, is to make people aware that this is going on, not just outside of our community, but in our community as well. And it's important for us to all try and, you know, change our little slice of the world. That's what one of the guests said, and I love it so much. Like, there's so much to do in the world, so much happening, but the least we can do is try to change one slice. So something that I preach on the podcast is continually educating yourself. Listening to the podcast is a great way to be an ally because you're learning about the experiences that you not necessarily knew existed. Another way is to um, be open to asking questions and changing the space around you. So like what we talk about on the podcast is if you don't know why something was offensive and someone's telling you it's offensive, be, you know, be, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to go and continually educate yourself and make it seem that it's not okay to say those things in your space because that's important about making the path of least resistance as my first guest said. Like, it's been so comfortable to get away with so much for so long because people don't know what everyone goes through. So it's our responsibility to change that. And the podcast helps you do that. There's, there's steps in there to help you do that. Um. Well, I'm well known not to be uh, very conversant in social media. I'm told your Twitter handle says, filmmaker, <laughs> filmmaker always in search of a new story and adventure. Yes. How do you find the stories worth telling? How do you, what, what, what hits you that causes you to say, ah, this, this works. This is, this is what I'm going to do next. Oh, you know what? I've never, I think. It starts for me about just being naturally curious. I've always been naturally curious. It's one of the things that my mom probably loves and hates the most about me is when I was a kid, my favorite word was why? Why? I would do that all day. Why, why, why? Why, why, why is it like that? Why this, why that? So when I want to like learn something, like, you know, when, I, when I'm curious about somebody's perspective that's not my own, I will why them to death. So <laughs> that's been helpful for me creating stories and finding stories is because I just want to learn as much as I can in this world before my time's up. And it, you know, doesn't happen unless you're proactive in it. Indy, we gotta, we gotta wrap this up here shortly, but I'm, I so love the way you tell the story about how you came to do breaking the cycle, mm -hmm. that, that you were headed in a different direction and it sort of came undone suddenly. Would you mind sharing that story with us and, and, and how you wound up telling the story you did? Yeah, Jack, I, I love that you like to ask this question because it is quite funny looking back, but in the moment I was very stressed. So how it, happened, how it came along is that I took a um, class my fifth year called documentary filmmaking. And in it, we had to find a subject, create a documentary, all by the end of the semester. So how things shook out, me and my partner had an idea of wanting to do something about discrimination. So we found a gay Holocaust survivor. And the day before we were getting ready to go, I mean, our car was packed up, equipment ready to go. And he calls us the day before and says, you know what? You know, I'm not comfortable and confident in doing it. Don't come. It was while I respect him and I completely understand I knew my professor would not respect that excuse. And I needed to get my job done. So I actually, you know, I'm telling this story like how I'm confident I had a plan, what I was gonna do. That's not what happened. You know what I did? I called my, my aunt and my family and I started crying. And in that moment while I was crying, my aunt was like, I don't understand what the issue is. You wanna do a story about discrimination when your mother is a minority um homosexual woman who was a single mother like what are you talking about and in that moment it's like she hung up and me and my partner looked at each other and said okay well i guess we're doing that 
and we drove right to Detroit, no plan, just our film equipment, and we just started to capture what we saw. And what was interesting is that the project was very difficult for me. People don't realize that, but because I was so close to it, because that's how I grew up, because that was my life and my perspective, I didn't see how that was interesting to the audience. So my film partner was great because he, <laughs> the whole time the uh, along the way, he was like, put this in here, put this in here. And I was like, no, that is just my mom talking. How is that interesting? But as I rewatched the film, that's kind of helped me in my career now because I'm learning that your perspective is your perspective and my perspective is my perspective and we'll never know what they are until we start conversing um, until we have a conversation about it until we share with one another so that was like an implemental part of my um learning process and i'm so grateful for everyone that was a part of it but yeah jack it was a definite struggle getting there it wasn't as easy as <laughs> i expected it to be starting off well i love it because i think in all our lives sometimes the things that most are most impactful, most sort of change our course, aren't because of something intentional, right? They're, they're, they're because we were open to, to the opportunity when it presented itself or the crisis in your case, when it presented itself. Um, and, and that's a lot of the best things we do come from that. I, I thank you so much for joining us today. I, I feel a little like Pete. I keep using you. One of these times you're going to say, no, Jack, this is, this is like the eighth interview. I'm not doing any more, but I, I love having you with us. And, and, and I hope our audience got a sense of how this all sort of fits together. In, in, in a world in which media is evolving every day and in ways we can't fully anticipate, you got to have two things. You got to have great partners who are leaders in the industry like NBC and Pete Pavacqua. And you've got to be committed to telling your own story and finding your own ways, whether it's a podcast or streaming something or doing it on the ACC network, you've got to find your own way to just tell your story and distribute your content. And FIM with incredibly talented people like Indy allows us to do that. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. I hope this industry insight was of some interest and value to you. We appreciate all you do uh, for Notre Dame Athletics. What, what connects all of the people who are participating today, whether talking or as, as, as audience members, is your passion for this university and your support of it. We thank you so much for that support. I look forward to when we can do this Notre Dame Athletic Summit in person in New York with industry leaders like we plan to, and I promise we will get that done. So thanks so much to all of you for joining us today.